So officially, welcome to Archives for Artists. Um, thank you all for joining us. This talk is hosted by the GLBT Historical Society Archives team. Um, my name is Kelsey Evans, she, her pronouns, and I'm the Director of Archives and Special Collections at the Historical Society. Uh, my colleagues are gonna introduce themselves. Hey, um, everybody. I'm Isaac Feldman, the Managing Reference Archivist. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And uh, my big news is that my oven is no longer on fire, so I can be here tonight. I've had a very interesting evening. <laughs> Please go on, Devin. Um, yeah, I don't have any oven issues right now. Um, hi, I'm Devin. I'm again much more. I am uh I use he, him pronouns, and I am a project archivist at the GLBT Historical Society. Thanks, everybody. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things. Um, during the presentation, please just stay on mute. Um, we'll make time at the end for questions, um, so we'll definitely open it up um, then. Um, so in tonight's talk, we are going to focus on archival resources and services that are relevant to artists looking to incorporate LGBTQ historical material into their creative and artistic practices. Um, we'll open with a brief discussion of some of the amazing ways that creators have used our archives um, and sort of approached the material. And next, we'll talk about how to access historical resources, um, really focus on remote access um, and our digital collections, other relevant digital hubs. Um, then we'll wrap up with a discussion of how to do deeper research in the physical archives um, and answer some common questions related to licensing and reuse, um, including topics like copyright, fair use, uh, et cetera. Um, we'll talk for about 45 minutes. Um, and like I said, we'll have room at the end for questions. Um, we'll, we'll also be uh, sharing the slides with folks who registered for the talk. So we're going to share a lot of links um, and websites. We will share all of that with you following the talk. Tonight's talk is the first of two events. The second will focus on LGBTQ archives for educators. Um, and this event series is supported by funding provided by the state of California, administered by the California State Library. Um, also several of the digital collections that we're gonna talk about tonight were supported by the state funding as well. Um, so we just really wanted to call that out and um, express how grateful we are for the state's ongoing support of this work. Slide, um, my colleague is driving the slide, so you'll hear us call slide <laughs> as throughout the presentation. Um, before we really get into things, I wanted to just briefly introduce the society, especially for folks who may be joining us for the first time. The GLBT Historical Society is an independent nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1985, and our mission is to collect, preserve, and share the history of LGBTQ people and culture with a special focus on Northern California. Uh, we have two sites, our museum in the Castro and the archives and reading room in the mid-market district of San Francisco, um, sort of near the Tenderloin. In the archives, we house over a thousand individual archival collections that occupy more than 4,000 linear feet of storage. Uh, material in the archives includes personal papers, organizational records, oral histories, audiovisual recordings and photographs, periodicals, works of art and artifacts, um, and various textiles. So we really have a lot of different kinds of material, um, and especially as a queer archive, we think really broadly about what constitutes archival material. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more as we explore the digital collections. So you can learn more about all of our work on our website at glbthistory.org. Um, and if you really wanna support us, you can become a member or donate through our support page. Um, so with that, Isaac is gonna take it away and tell us some more about some past creative projects. provided I'm no longer muted. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. It's really lovely to see you tonight. Um, so uh, we have such a variety of uh, types of research researchers in our archives. And one of our major constituencies is actually already artists. And um, artists use archives in a variety of ways. I find that sometimes people are looking for information, others for imagery, others for vibes, you know, that feeling of a time and place. Uh, as an artist myself, uh, I'm a novelist. I, I'm really familiar with some of the unique differences that there are between artists and every other person who's doing historical research in terms of uh, how we look for and experience the things that uh, archives can give us. So I'm just going to give some brief case studies and profiles of other folks that I've worked with in the past uh, so you can get a sense of the breadth of all that. Um, here we are. 
So uh, the first person I wanted to talk about, uh, the cartoonist and illustrator, Justin Hall. Um, Justin recently drew on the archives for reference images and oral histories for a bus shelter poster campaign. Um, you've seen like a, a lot of these campaigns. Uh, they've been doing them up and down Market Street for a few years. Um, they were a very vital source of that good museum feeling in the city during quarantine when one of us could go out to museums. So uh, Justin's project uh, was about assorted um, assorted like major figures in the queer history of San Francisco, including uh, Jose Saria. Um, Devin's actually going to talk about Jose a little bit later on in his own part of the talk, but in brief, uh, Jose was a figure who lived a lot of lives over a lot of years. And one of the things that he was known for early on in his career is his drag. Um, before he had sort of this whole second political life, uh, before he founded the... Uh... Oh God. The Imperial Court. <laughs> the Imperial Court. I blinked on an important phrase of San Francisco. Um, Jose did these full length parodies of operas, which really tells you something about the ways that the queer community like like centered on, you know, this kind of grand culture. Um, he would do them in a bar called the Black Cat. And uh, Justin wanted to capture some of the feeling of being the Black Cat for uh for, for his show, but um, he didn't, as you can sort of see on the panel on the right, end up interpreting it totally literally. He picked up the lanterns that are over Jose's head. Um, he sort of uh, went for like a slightly more mask of center drag than Jose is doing in the historical photo on the left. Um, he added uh, some details and took them away. Uh, it was very educational for me as a person who is fascinated by comics, but is not a cartoonist to sort of see the ways that the art of illustration um, is, is just all about taking what is useful uh, from reality and discarding the rest. Um, I also appreciated watching his process um, include like more direct use of historical imagery as in this redraw of uh, Jose's campaign poster, uh, which you know simplifies the image quite a bit, but preserves the, um, the typography and sort of like Jose's marvelously flirtatious expression. Um, another artistic uh, group that I've worked with recently is uh, Raw Dance. And uh, I, I really, they're still working on the dance performance, which is going to be the, uh, the result of all of their archival work. Uh, the final product is going to be on, on, uh, on stage in December. I would highly recommend Googling it because from what I've seen so far of their drafts, it's really exciting. So um, Loving Still is a performance that's based on homoerotic images of the past, uh, sort of pictures of people who we don't really know how they identified or how they felt about each other. Uh, we have no shortage of these here at the Historical Society. Sometimes we have some details about the folks' identities. Sometimes we really know nothing. Um, you can see on the far right here, um, this is uh, Jiro Onuma, uh, a Japanese American uh, amateur photographer who um, loved to take photos of himself and his friends and his lovers in 1930s San Francisco. They would also often go in for posed photos in photo studios in Japantown. And we, we can see up here, because we know some things about Jiro, um, we can extrapolate that the man on the left here is uh, a partner of his. And we can also extrapolate because we knew that he was gay. This was intended as a romantic pair of images. If you if you put them together, um, the, the two poses on the grass, they would be holding each other. They would be spooning. And they were able to capture the romance of their relationship without uh, breaking the privacy and, uh, the, and the positiveness that was, of course, far more socially necessary back then. Um, we, we also have these these two uh, lovely service women uh, in a World War II era photo. Uh, we don't really know anything about them. This collection, I, I believe, was just found secondhand. We, we've lost what archivists call provenance, uh, the details of the story of this object's life. We, we can sort of assume from the ways that they're holding their hands and the ways that they're touching each other that these women are a couple, but it, it, just knowing it, um, it is impossible. And I think that what Raw Dance is thinking their way into with their dance is this recognition that sometimes archives don't offer answers. They give us questions and suggestions and vibes. 
And they're, what they're bringing up is the idea that you sometimes have to respond to ambiguity with fiction and with things like dance, where you can pick up on the language of gesture that you are seeing in front of you and adapting it into movement that brings these couples to life. Um, another project, uh, this, this I think was researched last year and uh, put on, uh, performed this year. Um, this is uh, Sylvester, The Mighty Reel, uh, which was a, a musical that was performed um, on in, in, Haight, in at the Haight-Ashbury intersection for a few uh, months earlier this year. And uh, Sylvester, in case you are not familiar with the Queen of Disco, uh, was a multi-talented, very genderqueer, like avant la lettre, um, you know, definitely fascinated by exploring gender in his performance and in his daily life. Um, you know, disco singer, but also explored lots and lots of different genres, was a drag queen, had um, many, many lives, and in, in this case, a, a very, a very short life. Um, he, he died of, of AIDS before he was 40. Um, so the creators of this uh, musical, which was, like I said, meant to be performed out in public for people who would have a wide variety of levels of knowledge of uh, if his history uh, as an artist. Um, they came to the archives because they wanted to learn first and foremost about Sylvester's look. You know, how would they costume play to actually capture the feeling of the zenith of disco? How did uh, he as a performer use costume to bring across the kind of glamour that he dreamed of as, as a creator? Um, they also came here just to commune with Sylvester's memory and to feel close to him, because that's also very important to their creative process. The uh, director, the costume designer, and the writer of the play all visited at different times. Um, they were particularly interested in the details of Sylvester's costumes, the uh, the shapes, the sizes, you know, like just what they indicate about the shape of his body and you know, what it might have been like to be in a room with somebody who had a physicality specifically like his. Um, but also the the Velcro inside the costumes for quick change, you know, the marks of sweat that you would leave behind, performing under hot lights, um, the, just the ways that the uh, skirts and, and pants like sat so that you would, you know, they they did some quick math and were like, well, you know, uh, I, I am 6'5" you know, said the right, uh, or something like that. He was a tall man. And I think that he was also very tall. And if the, the pants sat about here, the heels needed to be six inches. And, and so it was, again, as an archivist, I just get to soak up all of the things that people say to me about their process and just assimilate it. Um, yeah, getting to come to the archives, touch what the person touched. A, a couple more profiles before I had you over back to my colleagues to talk about some of the great things that we have in the archives. Um, here's some work uh, by Marcel Pardo Ariza. Um, Marcel has had a very, uh, like, like a, a widely varied photographic career, um, which has not been very long yet. I can't wait to see what they're going to come up with over, over the whole course of their artistic life. But one major project that they have done uh, for a couple of years is, is different forms of incorporating historical imagery into their work. Um, I mean, as you can see, that there are different levels of saturation in the figures in this photo here on the right. Um, the person on the left is, is a cardboard standee uh, made from a photo uh, taken in 1977 by Crawford Barton, uh, a photographer whose collection is in our archives. Person on the right is, of course, uh, contemporary. Um, these figures look or don't look at each other. They don't, they touch or they don't touch each other. Sometimes they seem intimate, sometimes very distant. Um, uh, just other examples, um, move, placing the historical photos in the foreground or the background, um, just interpreting this relatively simple idea in ways that play differently. Um, so Marcel's material, uh, really brings home to me as an archivist um, the complexities of working ethically with archives, um, including uh, sort of what it means to create a transformative work, thinking about how to collaborate with a person who is uh, who is long, who at the very least is gone from the scene and place that they inhabited back then, which, you know, by definition, it's over, everybody's gone. Uh, in some cases, the person might also be dead. And so how do you collaborate with, uh, with, with somebody who uh, you can't talk to. Um, and I see that E.G. Crichton is, is actually in the chat. 
uh, who has done some spectacular work, uh, matchmaking um, artists who are alive with artists from the archives. Um, hi. Um, it, it, well, Marcel's uh, work also brings up uh, a lot of copyright questions, which I'm going to talk about later. But basically, boy, are there a lot of copyright questions in archives, but we are here to help with those and uh, help you achieve what you want to with your art. Um, last thing, uh, I don't know if people remember the somewhat ill-fated 2022 romantic comedy Bros, which is set at a fictitious queer museum, uh, queer history museum in New York. Um, but uh, it's an example, of one of many films at we have collaborated to it with in various ways. Most of them are documentaries. This one was a feature, but it's by far not the only feature that we've done. Uh, we help provide archival imagery to dress sets, provide space for interviews, and arrange for historical clips and images to be used on screen, such as, for example, in this, I haven't seen this movie yet. They are fighting over a rainbow flag in front of a giant photo of Jose Saria. That's all I know. Um, but yeah, in addition to helping people um, find the images that they need. We also can connect filmmakers with community members to act as consultants and place these things in context so that, for example, you can create something like a fake museum in a fictitious film. Um, we have also worked, as I said, with many documentarians, uh, finding images to illustrate topics uh, from documentaries about queer comedy, gay adult bookstores. We're doing one right now on the history of the Carabiner, uh, which is so niche, but sometimes it's the niche ones that surprise you with their sort of universal interest. So, um, okay, uh, I am done with my bit for now, and I am going to hand you back. Okay, um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, good. Um, thank you, Isaac. Um, so um, I am excited to talk to you a bit about our digital collections, um, which uh, you can access from anywhere. Um, I'll spend a little time introducing you to the collections and then turn to some, we'll turn to some specific examples. Um, when we're talking about digital collections, we're um, really talking about two different kinds of things. Um, on the one hand, that we have collections of videos and photographs and computer files, which have always been digital. They may have been sort of shot on a digital camera or created by computers. And we do have a number of collections that look like that, um, especially some more recent oral history collections. Um, sort of for born digital is the phrase that we use. Um, but the bulk of our digital collections consist of uh, samples of our vast analog holdings in. Um, LGBTQ, um, the LGBTQ historical record. Um, we scan, we photograph, we transfer key documents and video cassettes and costumes and photos and all kinds of other materials from selected collections so that um, you don't always have to travel to San Francisco um, to our reading room on a work day in order to engage with historical materials. You can do it from home. Um, you can actually do all of your research um, with our online collections, or um, because they kind of offer a preview to collection to our in-person collections, you can start, get a preview, and then continue on to work in person. Um, if you want to explore our digital collections, I think your first and best bet is to check out our digital collections page on our website, which is what's pictured on the slide here. Um, there are a bunch of ways to get there, but honestly, the easiest one is just to Google GLBT Historical Society Digital Collections. Um, it'll be the top result. Click it, and you'll come to this page. Um, you'll see a list of our over 80 digital collections. Um, I think last I saw, we had like 89. Um, and you'll also find um, information about collections available through partners like Yale Cengage, which we'll talk about later. Um, okay, slide. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to 11 new digital collections that we've been able to make like, available to artists and to other users in recent months. Um, among these are large collections of photographs, um, like those from Efrain Gonzalez and Jean-Baptiste Carré, um, and interviews, including uncut versions of interviews um, that Susan Stryker conducted for the documentary Screaming Queens, which is um, about Compton's cafeteria. 
um, these, uh, this, this digitization has all been thanks to the support of the California State Library grant that Kelsey mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. So we're really excited to be able to share these with you. Um, yeah, and now we're going to dig into some specific examples, um, and Kelsey is going to start that off. Thanks, Evan. Um, so a really important resource we have in the archives is our extensive collection of LGBTQ periodicals, including publications um, like popular magazines, organizational newsletters, and creative zines. Um, so I want to touch on one periodical in particular because it's a really rich resource that can be accessed um, very deeply remotely. Um, so we're going to look at the Bay Area Reporter Archive. The BAR is an LGBTQ weekly newspaper established in 1971 in San Francisco. Um, it's still active. We fully digitized the paper's run from 1971 to 2005, and it's fully keyword searchable, which is um, what's really great. So the BAR is often one of the first places I go to search a specific topic or name or group that folks ask about. Um, as an example, I was recently um, doing a little research for our communications team um, about Halloween and just sort of finding something fun um, that they could share. So in addition to finding all these sort of fabulous articles about queer Halloween, Halloween celebrations, um, there was also this really thoughtful piece by trans activist Gwendolyn Ann Smith in 2001. Um, in the article, she talks about how Halloween can be this night of gender exploration and how important that can be for an individual's personal growth, um, especially for trans people. Um, and it has this great illustration as well. Um, so that's just one example of the sort of um, unexpected stories you can find in the BAR that can be useful for all, all kinds of projects. Slide. Um, our digital collections also feature selections from personal papers. Um, these collections can include an individual's personal writings, photographs, um, records from their work life, really anything that documents their personal and professional experiences. Um, so to give you an example of one of these collections, we're gonna look at the Denise Deanne papers. Um, Deanne was an activist, environmentalist, civil servant, writer, restaurateur, and candidate for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, um, and, and she was a trans woman who transitioned in 1968. Um, so she just lived this really like huge life um, and had all of these different really diverse interests. So the digital collections um, includes really just a sampling from her, from her papers, but it has items like these amazing photographs, um, as well as personal writings, including a memoir that she wrote in 1969, shortly after she transitioned called Male Facade. Um, so as you can see, personal papers like these can be especially useful if you're looking for those unique individual stories that connect to larger themes. Slide. Uh, moving into some audiovisual resources, um, we'll look at digitized film and video collections um, that are really rich and many have been digitized. Um, many of our film and video collections, I should say. Um, and these are really used extensively by documentarians, filmmakers, um, and artists of all kinds looking to sort of for the content, but also to soak up the sort of vibe of the space um, or time um, and watch and sometimes hear people interacting. So one of the most um, sort of requested and used film collections is this collection of eight millimeter films featuring queer bar scenes, drag events, and imperial court activities from the 1960s. Um, and we're going to show you just a real quick clip from um, one of these films. The anticipation makes it better. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kelsey, this is going very nolly. Um Okay. How about we we'll put a pause in it and then we can you can work on oh, it. Oh, I've I've just got it actually. No yeah, worries. I apologize. Um there you go. So these there's no sound with these films. Um this is 1969, um, and it was sort of an um an event around Empress Reba. there's these sort of group shots you can see people kind of responding to the really bright light that is shining in this very dark bar um and then folks kind of just start um interacting 
with the with the camera here. Okay, that's good. Ed. So it gives you a sense of them. Um, they are, if you really want to get sucked into some 60s fabulousness, they're they're really great to, to dive into. Um, other footage in other collections um, includes pride parades, um, Folsom leather events. Uh, we have queer comedy sets from the Valencia Rose, um, street interviews in the Castro, gay motorcycle club runs, dance performances, uh, and so many others. Um, we really have sort of rich video footage um, around a lot of different topics. And many of these are accessible on our digital collections page. Slide. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm a... Uh... It's all right. I'm I get sorry. Started. I'm having, yeah, if you, if you want to just, uh, I can queue up the next thing if you want to just give it verbally. Yeah, that's fine. We're going to talk about radio shows next and audio. Um, so we have a lot of um, audio recordings in the, in the archives as well, two which we're going to focus on now are radio shows from the 1970s and 1980s called Fruit Punch and the Gay Life. Um, Fruit Punch was a gay radio program that debuted on KPFA FM Berkeley in 1973 and The Gay Life um, was hosted by journalist Randy Alfred um, a little bit later. So episodes for both shows are um, keyword searchable on our website, um, and they include, they include just a real diversity of topics. And um, these were sort of news talk radio um, shows, so they featured a lot of interviews. Um, and these are, these are really great recordings if you're looking to hear people sort of telling their own stories and their own voices. Um, we're going to listen to a clip from uh, of Martin Warman and Pristine Condition of the Coquettes talking with Randy Alfred in 1979. And there might be music right at the beginning, but it will go into an interview. And I'm realizing preemptively that I forgot to do the sound. All right. Try to listen to them. All right, uh, we're not going to be listening to this tonight. Okay. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, well, it's a radio show, and they're funny, so we. It's, it's really have... great. Yeah, <laughs> we'll send out. Um, the link. I like I said, we'll send. No worries, it's fine. We'll send out the link, like I said, after this um, meeting, so folks can hear more of it. Um, but those are really great radio shows. Um, we also just digitized. Um, the Mary Richards papers, which are these um, audio cassette recordings of journalist Mary Richards interviewing people for stories for the BAR um, for the 1980s and 1990s. So again, these just really, really rich um, collections of audio recordings. Uh, Devin, I'm gonna pass it to you next. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about a few more kinds of materials sort of continuing on with um, from what Kelsey was talking about. Um, and I'm going to start with event ephemera, which are one of my favorite kinds of materials that we have in the archives. Um, event materials are uh, things like flyers and little handouts and programs from parties and conferences and rallies and pageants, those kinds of events. Um, ephemera is kind of by its nature, not meant to last, but sometimes kind of because of that, you can learn the most about day-to-day -day life from ephemeral materials. Um, a great example of that can be seen in the digital collection we built from the Jose Saria papers. Um, as Isaac mentioned earlier, Saria was a San Francisco performer and an activist. Um, in 61, he ran for a supervisor seat in San Francisco as what we think is the first openly gay politician, a political candidate in US history. Um, he was also a drag performer who had lined in the black hat. Um, and these interests kind of came together when he founded the imperial court system, um, which you may be familiar with. Um, his digital collection includes some photos of uh, performances of the Black Hat, but the bulk of the collection consists of programs from imperial court events from all over California. Um, these programs are an example of event ephemera and are great because you can, you know, see basic stuff like who was being crowned and who was, and, and where they're being crowned and who was part of what courts, but you can also learn things about the texture of queer life. 
Um, so on the slide, I have some images um, from the program from the 1984 coronation and um, uh, for the Fresno court. And um, one thing you can kind of learn from this, you'll see that um, there's an advertisement from the Carousel Restaurant, which was an event sponsor, and they were advertising an after um, uh, an after hours breakfast buffet for um, to take place after the coronation. Um, and when the, and I just think it's worth noting, um, we often kind of think about queer spaces as being bars or nightclubs, really centered on nightlife uh, often. But um, I think event programs like this can help us to imagine or really think about how we've made spaces for ourselves um, all over the place and sometimes in less probable places like roadside restaurants like this. Um, so it invites us to sort of think about the different kinds of way, places that like queer life has taken shape. Uh, slide. Um, as Kelsey was kind of mentioning earlier, one of the ways that we, the GLBT Historical Society, are a bit different to more from more traditional archives is that we have a pretty expansive sense of what counts as the historical record. Um, and this include this sort of extends and is exemplified by our costume and artifact collections. Um, as we know, for queer communities, uh, the clothes we wear and the things we buy and make can say a lot about who we are and what we think and how we live. Um, and sort of based on that, we have a, we have extensive collections of T-shirts and leather and drag and costumes. Um, and one of one great collection that centers um, these sorts of uh, materials, especially costumes, is Sylvester's, who Isaac talked about earlier. Um, uh, Sylvester was a black, gay, genre bending singer songwriter, um, most famous for the song "You Make Me Feel Mighty Real." And our digital collection really centers on Sylvester's costumes, these incredible costumes, which are a testament to Sylvester's glamorous aesthetics his close relationships with designers um, and his expansive experiences of gender. Um, and I just wanted to include this image of the, the stunning purple and black beaded cape um, that we have in our collections and that Sylvester wore in performances. Um, we have so many costume collections and textile collections that are on site and we're always super excited when researchers wanna see them. So I just wanna plug, if you are able to make it in person, you should um, check them out because they're great. Um, okay, slide. Um, next, I wanna talk about um, oral histories, uh, which are recorded interviews in which people narrate life experiences, kind of reflections and memories and conversation with an interviewer. Um, oral histories are super rich sources. Um, they can help to, to document the perspectives of people who might not otherwise appear in the historical record, who don't meet, who for lots of reasons, the paper, personal papers or whatever may not end up in archives. Um, but the, I think one of the most exciting things is they, they can give that sort of personal, um, they give access to a kind of subjective or kind of personal experience of the past, sort of similar to the personal papers that Kelsey was talking about earlier, thinking about how an individual's experience connects to broader themes. Um, the GLBT Historical Society holds hundreds of oral histories. Um, we have a large legacy oral history collection, as well as some more recent smaller collections. Um, you can find some audio and video oral history recordings by browsing our digital collections page that I was talking about earlier. Um, but the best way to identify interviews um, in our big legacy oral history collection, which is our largest sort of um, where the bulk of them are, um, is to use the oral history catalog. Um, to find that catalog, you go to glbthistory.org and you toggle over archives in the menu and you click on search collections. And I sort of have a picture of that in the slide right now. Um, and if you scroll down, you'll see a search box where you can search for oral histories using names and key terms. Uh, slide. Um, just to give one example of this. Say you wanted to find oral well, histories in which the narrators discuss the activist group Queer Nation. Um, so I did a search for Queer Nation, and the search returned 10 oral histories. Um, and I just wanted to draw your attention to two features of these search results. Um, first, you can see in the first interview, 
um, there's a little red link that says transcript. Um, and that indicates that there's a digitized transcript available for this interview. So you can actually read it um, from home and it's not, um, and it's just available for you right there from the web page. Um, another thing that's not really visible from these results, but I wanted to share is that um, we actually have many digitized versions of, um, of a lot of our oral histories, even if the digital version isn't of the recording isn't necessarily visible on um, our web page or kind of on the publicly facing internet. And so, for example, I know for a fact that these um, queer nation related oral histories um, are all digitized. And so if there's, which all of which is to say, if there's an interview that interests you, you can email Isaac and maybe you may discover that you can listen to it remotely for a small fee. Okay, slide. Um, yeah, so in addition to the digital collections page that I mentioned earlier, um, we also have um, digitized a significant um, volume of uh, our materials in partnership with Gail Sengage. And um, you can learn more about those um, materials um, by looking under the subscription-based collections heading on our digital collections page. You scroll past all of the collections that we've been talking about and to the section that says subscription-based collections. Um, there you'll find details about some databases, including the biggest one that Gail Sengage offers, which is Archives of Gender and Sexuality. Um, it has materials from many of our largest and oldest collections, um, including an expansive periodical collection. Um, it also has materials from uh, numerous other queer archives around the US and Canada. And the nice thing about Archives of Gender and Sexuality is that it's full text searchable. So you can use a keyword, it'll look through thousands of pages of historical materials. Um, slide. So just as a very quick example, um, say I wanted to learn more about the activist group Gay Shame. I did a quick keyword search for Gay Shame. Uh, turns up numerous uh, archival materials. You can see it has uh, 34 examples from manuscript collections, 111 from newspapers and periodicals. Just an example of what the search results look like. Um, slide. And you can see just one example of a document that I found in this search. So here's a 2002 article um, uh, from Frontiers News Magazine based in San Francisco that gives a kind of more, you know, a, a, a mainstream assessment of the group. Um, and um, yeah, you can learn a little bit how they were perceived um, at this historical moment. It's easy to find stuff like this through the full, touch, the full text search capability. Um, this database is behind a paywall. Um, but if you email us, uh, email us at reference at gobthistory.org, we can send you a link uh, to access this um, database for your personal research. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand it off to Kelsey, who's going to discuss um, archival materials sort of available more broadly beyond our own resources. Um, I'm going to zip through these really fast because I want to make sure we have time at the end for questions. I know, Isaac, you have um, a bit to wrap up with, too, around um, that. So. This one is Calisphere. This is a project of the UC. Um, it is a collaborator. It's, a, it's an aggregator hub um, of material from institutions all throughout the state. Next. DPLA is sort of a national version of Calisphere. So you can search digitized collections from all across the United States. Um, there's, as I say, there are over 49 million um, images to, tech, to search there. Slide. The Digital Transgender Archive is a hub dedicated to documenting trans history. Um, it's really great, has really great resources from, again, institutions um, all across the country. Next. LGBTQ um, oral history hubs include the LGBTQ Oral History Digital Collaboratory um, and the Outwards Archive, um, both of which include video, transcripts, links to other oral history projects. These are really great hubs if you're looking for oral histories. Next, um, if you're doing some material culture work, these this is called Wearing Gay History. Um, it's a digital archive of historical LGBTQ t-shirts, um, many of which are from our archives, but also pulled from archives all throughout um, different repositories. Next. Oh, this is, that was it. And now, uh, yeah. <laughs> that was this my is... quick, quick through those. Now it's Isaac's turn to wrap up. This is all me. Wrap. I'm. I'm just going to spend like a couple minutes talking to you about uh, working in archives and using the reading room. Um, not every 
everybody is comfortable coming into an archive for the first time, but uh, I just want you to know the archivist is really not there to gatekeep your visit, um, nor if they're doing their job right, should they be there to, um, you know, to, to, to just make you feel bad and to limit uh, the intellectual and emotional experience you have. Uh, they should be here to introduce you to the archives and, you know, show you all that they're capable of. Um, so things to remember, um, archives aren't like libraries in that you can't browse the shelves. Instead, you work in the reading room. You can see this uh, photo of our reading room as it looked a couple years ago. It's actually cooler now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just it's just kind of a small conference room, you know, in a basement. Um, just, but the things that happen in it, you know, are are really pretty magical. Um, most archives are open to the public by appointment, including us, uh, and you do not need a reason to visit. You don't need to have a project already in mind. You can find something in the catalog that you find intriguing or have a topic in mind that you could email me. And we can just figure out, you know, what would be a, a good way to use a few hours of time. And uh, that can include uh, personal interest. It can include, I have the germ of an idea, but it's not anywhere yet. Uh, it can include, I want to research the history of a community that I'm part of. Uh, an archivist will bring you boxes based on what you find in our catalog, as well as our own suggestions. Uh, if you would like, I am all too happy to give suggestions most of the time. Very enthusiastic fan of uh, suggesting things for people. Uh, the archivist is there as an interpreter, as a guide, and as a box carrier. I am just sort of like a very strange combination of like wilderness guide and waiter. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm here to make sure that you feel like you are having a connection with history that is fresh and new each time. So I'm going to go very quickly through how to use our catalog. It's just it's kind of a dated piece of web design. So uh, the golden rule of archiving is always to ask the archivist questions. Um, you should do that if you have any trouble dealing with this. But basically, it's hosted on the Online Archive of California, OAC, uh, which is an aggregator site that collects a bunch of different archives throughout the state. Um, you can look at a list, you can search, you can do all the typical things that one does in a catalog. Um, you'll, you'll sort of see sort of this similarly dated page uh, when you click into something that you find intriguing. Um, at the bottom of the uh, list of stuff on the right-hand pane, you'll see a little button that says additional collection guides. That's where you actually find uh, the archival finding aid, which gives you a list of the materials inside a collection and some notes that will tell you context for it. Um, in this case, the Lou Sullivan papers, this is a huge collection, so it's got a really long finding aid that really is going to function as a roadmap to help you navigate a collection of this complexity um, where we can see it's broken down into series on different topics and within those series it is broken down into folders and uh, yeah if, if you want to see uh, this collection by, by transmasculine pioneer and diarist Lou Sullivan you can just come do that and say hey, Isaac I would like to see box one and I'll be like great uh, with no further ado box one will come to you and then you can open this up and see a diary recording of a man's entire life from the ages of 10 to the ages of 39, uh, chronicling all of his emotional and like social and sexual world. Um, steps for working in the reading room, uh, which can be kind of intense. Um, in addition to asking the archivist for help, uh, remember to take care of yourself, take breaks, have a little sip of water, do not be surprised if the work is emotional. That part of you know reaching out a hand and touching history is that you're also going to have unpredictable experiences and le learn painful things or just very personal things. You'll also learn things that make you feel ecstatic and inspired. I, I can say this for an absolute fact because that's how I feel when I work with this, these things myself. Um, I'll lay out a few simple rules for handling the collections, but you, the main thing is that you just have to be physically careful with them, just sort of the way that you would treat anything that's precious. And lastly, you'll have the best time if you let go of expectations about what you're going to find and just sort of embrace what you do find. These collections are 
they're, most of them are sourced from people who simply offer them to us. So they don't tell a complete story of history. They tell the semi-complete story of personal and organizational lives. Um, licensing and reproductions, all this stuff might come into your artistic life, for example, if you want to include a copy of a photo or a quote from something that we own in uh, in your artwork. Uh, copyright is complicated, as like I said, but I'm here to help. Um, part of the reason it's complicated is that copyright is inherited like any other property. To use people's work, you need to talk to them and their heirs. Um, sometimes we are their heir, and we have been donated the copyright as well as the work, in which case things are easier. Um, sometimes it's, it's also complicated because copyright, like so many other things, is not designed with queer people's needs in mind. Uh, for example, before marriage equality and civil unions, people's longtime partners often did not inherit their work or the rights to allow somebody to reprint it in a book or as part of their own art project. So uh, for all of these reasons, um, I would really, really encourage you uh, once again to email me and uh, I will solve your problems. It is literally my entire job description. Um, yeah, there's going to be forms. I'm just going to leave it at that uh, if you want to reproduce something or get a copy of it. And uh, yeah, I am the expert on my collections. And so, yeah, I can't reiterate. You should talk to me any more time. So I'm going to stop doing it, but you should. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to open up the room to questions. I'm going to stop sharing in a moment, maybe if you want to, you know, drop down our emails, but all this stuff will be available yeah uh, after the talk too yeah thank you isaac um you can ask questions in the chat go ahead and ask those um start putting things in we'll just reiterate that um if you want to make an appointment that's sort of where the link is there um also all of our emails like isaac said are there um you can email any of us with any questions I will say also, if you want to know more about our work, we have a monthly newsletter that you can sign up for, um, where we share information about what's happening at the museum and the shows that are going on there, along with um, new things that are coming out in the archives, new collections, all of our work. Um, so that's a really great um, resource as well, if you want to keep sort of up to date on what's going on. Um, oh, yeah, we've got two really good ones. Anyone have... Does anyone have recommendations for archival artist funding sources or residencies? Um, as one example, um, we currently have a grant through the Creative Work Fund, which is sort of a city-based um, fund. And, and it is, it's really great. We designed a project um, with an author who's working on sort of um, an interesting hybrid novel um, about trans sort of Latinx ancestors, um, commingling with the archives. And so we sort of serve as the institutional partner. As an artist, you sort of pick an institutional partner to work with. Um, and then the funding, most of the funding goes to the artist um, with the organization getting sort of like a, um, administrative. So it's a joint grant, but but it is a really, um, I think it's up to like $50,000 at least for the, for the artist. Um, so Creative Work Fund would encourage folks to check that one out. Um, I don't know if there are others that Isaac or Devin jumped to mind. Um, um, I would just add, I this is this is one that I might have to look up online and get back to you about if you want to email it to me and remind me. But um, it, a lot of university archives will have and uh, just funding to come and do research. Uh, it's not strictly dis designed with any particular constituency in mind, but a lot of the time you'll surprise yourself uh, when you Google an archives and... Uh, with with just how much money is out there to fund people's research trips. Uh, we also have a similar program called the Allen Bear Bay Stipend. Mm -hmm. um, just asking a follow-up question about copyright in general, if images from an archive are used, but manipulated to the extent they don't appear like the original, does that still require permission? Um, Isaac, you can concur or disagree, but that would fall under fair use, um, which is transformative work. Um, so there is a whole, 
subsection within US copyright law called fair use, um, which protects all sorts of uses. Um, much of what we do as a library and archive for educational and research purposes only um, can in some way fall under fair use, um, but transform transformation is a really big part of a fair use claim um, to using material. Isaac, does that sum it up? Yeah, no, it basically does. Uh, sometimes the line between a, a derivative work and a transformative work is, you know, it, it's blurry. But um, I, I think that we also, um, as the copyright holders of a lot of our collections, uh, interpret things generally. We we want to uh, create possibilities, not shut them down. And uh, fair use really covers a lot of artistic use. Yeah, you'll still want to work directly. If you're using any material from an archive, you're still going to want to work really quickly closely with those archives because there may be other um, use fees or, or use agreements that an archive will require. So you're gonna need to talk through it no matter what, um, but but that's sort of a general fair use is important to know about as an artist. Um, and also because like I can get you high res scans and things like that, you know. Manipulate. <laughs> Um, um next question. Saying other sorts of art fundings um oh. SF Arts Commission. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's a good, a good city based. Yes, one. yes, thank you. Um I, um I also just wanted to chime in that um part of that that for me doing a project as artist in residence for the organization, part of what made it really work um was that I had that it, it transpired over a few years so I really had time to get into the archives to match and bring new people into the archives and Michelle T did a similar project where she invited writers to engage with archives of protest and that generated over a period of a few years this whole body of really exciting writing so I I would encourage the organization and I'm perfectly willing to help with this to really do a, a sort of official artist in residence thing, like a yearly project. I raised my own funds. I got two creative work fund grants, but there, there are other ways to raise smaller amounts. And, and the other thing is that um, when I worked with international archives, I found out a little bit about what other archives were doing. And one idea I really thought was great was the Australian Archives, which is now called Aqua. Um, they did a, a yearly poster award where they, they launched it as a competition and it was for artists to create a poster based on one archive, several archives, whatever. So a fairly simple, limited project. And then that poster became something that promoted the organization and the artist got paid to mm -hmm. do it. That's interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's something I'd like to to talk about internally. Um, I, I I just the artist in residence program was so cool, and I I think uh, yeah, go on. Well, there is. I just wanted to that reminded me that I um I I used to work at UCSF and their archives and special collections, and they have an artist in residency, or they have in the past at least, um, which they're a health a health sciences campus, so it's sort of about engaging with health science um archival material through an artistic lens. Um, so you you may never know where these artists and residencies within archives um, sort of are um, and how you could engage um, differently. So I, I think those projects are great. I absolutely hear that. And I think there are lots of archives doing um, doing those wonderful things. And it's, um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's more Jimmy, common in Europe, actually, like, like the London School of Economics has an artist in residence. Oh, there you um, go. So think broadly. Yeah, when so know. it's... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, Jimmy, I think you might have got one in Antarctica bit, too. A little bit late in the thing. Do do the archives have video footage? Yes, we have a lot of video footage. Look at our digital collections um, to to sort of get inspired there. Do we ever exhibit artists who've been inspired by your archives? E.g., we have. <laughs> um, that is one example. Um, but so yes, there are there are examples. The museum and the curatorial team is, is sort of a separate entity for the archives, so I don't want to speak too much to the museum. Um, but, but yes, there have been examples in the past um, around that. Any other, Devin is linking the UCSF Artist in Residence program, program there. Yeah, in addition to uh, the video footage that we have online, which is uh, a really 
a substantial amount of stuff uh, at this point from a bunch of different collections. Uh, quite a bit of it more is accessible in the reading room. We we try to digitize our video as much as we can, just because the uh, media it's stored on is, is among our most vulnerable. Uh, VHS, you know, it doesn't last. So. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, Isaac, if you want to show, we're going to send out um, a, a survey following this. So I'll put a little plug before we um, end our time. Um, we'd love to get your feedback on sort of what was useful to you about this talk. Um, we we like hosting um, we like hosting talks like this. I mean, I'm so gratified to see folks here and interested in this in this topic. Um, we really want to encourage diverse and creative use of our materials. Um, we really want to have an open door policy to, to anybody and everybody who wants to use the archives in whatever way kind of makes sense and resonates for you. Um, so please do let us know your feedback on this. And if you have any follow-up questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, and we just really want to invite everybody to come and learn more um, and come explore the archives. <laughs> Someone says it's 2 a.m. where they are. <laughs> Bless your heart. Um, all right. Yeah, you are. Uh, you are all very kind to come, but especially the person for whom it's two a.m. <laughs> um. um. All right. I think we will wrap up in the in respecting everybody's time tonight. Um. Thank you all so much again. Um. Isaac, if you want to flash the survey, but we'll send it out to attendees as well. Um. And like I said, this will be. We'll send out the the slides and then this will be recorded. So I'm gonna stop recording now. Thank you all so much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.